Hello and welcome to this special broadcast on One India. What has transpired in the vicinity of India is something which is nothing short of a shocking news. Bangladesh is in tatters and uh, the way there's a foreign hand is being talked about uh, in toppling the Sheikh Hasina government, uh, who instigated the students or whether there was more to it than what met the eye. But there has been no democracy in the world has got untouched, has remained untouched with efforts and uh, 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 insinuations, insinuations like these uh, where the governments have uh, found themselves in hot waters because of some third forces. Uh, how India was also in such position, how Prime Minister Modi's governments, governance in the last 10 years has thwarted them, these are some of the issues that one would definitely wonder and want to prod upon, especially for a fact that how and uh, in what ways could India prevent becoming or getting into a situation like Bangladesh? To discuss that further, I have with me Abhijit Ayer Mitra, Senior Fellow, Institute of Peace and Conflict Studies, IPCS. Abhijit, thank you so much for taking time out for One India. Thank you so much for having me on. Thank you, Abhijit. Well, Abhijit, in light of the recent incidents where foreign influence was alleged to have attempted uh, to destabilize India, such as the toolkit during the farmers' protest. Uh, how do you assess the Indian government's response in countering these, quote-unquote, external threats? Uh, so, you know, we have to understand, first of all, two things. Uh, one is there's a difference between Ukraine, Bangladesh, and India. Uh -huh. And there's also a difference in perceptions. So the first thing is, let's separate Ukraine from Bangladesh and India. You know, Europe generally seeks American validation. Ukraine is kind of, uh, most European countries, not just Ukraine, they've accepted to, you know, being second fiddle to America. Uh -huh. And, you know, kind of, uh, advancing an American game, they want to be in the American orbit, uh, which is why it is far easier for NGOs to pull off what they did in Ukraine uh -huh. than what they can do in India and Bangladesh. Uh, especially mm -hmm. because, you know, India still has some very, uh, let's say, not pleasant memories of uh, uh, American intervention in South Asia, mm -hmm. uh, especially with regard to the Bangladesh Liberation War. And the Bangladeshis, I think, much more so since 3 million of them died in 1971. Uh, that said, there are fundamental differences even between Bangladesh and India. Bangladesh, for a, for the longest time, till Sheikh Hasina stabilized their economy, used right. to be considered the Disneyland for NGOs. There wasn't a single NGO worth its salt mm -hmm. that did not have an outpost in Bangladesh. And it was, you know, sort of the petri dish for every uh, NGO idea that came about. And very, uh, it, it wasn't great for the Bangladeshis, but it was great for NGOs. It was their biggest uh, sort of cash cow, so to say. Mm -hmm. uh, the second is Bangladesh is also a fairly, compared to India, it's a centralized and homogenous society. It is not a federal structure. Everything is concentrated in Dhaka. And, you know, it's mostly overwhelmingly Bengali, or mm -hmm. at least the uh, ethos of Bengali. There is no acceptance of a sort of multi-ethnic, multi-religious, multilinguistic state. India in that way, you know, it is precisely the fact that we have a thousand different TV channels. Mm -hmm. which a lot of these American, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't like the word deep state, but a lot of these American progressives like to manipulate for their agendas. Mm -hmm. uh, the nuances have to be different. Forget from state to state. Forget from language to language. Even within every 100 kilometers, you know, the desires and the uh, uh, inadequacies change. Mm -hmm. So it becomes very difficult to message. You look at American diplomats in Delhi, they're always sitting at the Italian Cultural Center talking in English. They only talk to interlocutors who speak to them in English. Mm -hmm. And it's a sort of 1% view of, uh, you know, the elitist 1% Delhi, India view. It's not the Bharat right. view mm -hmm. happening in India. Right? Right. So this makes life uh, a lot tougher. Now, we need to remember what's happening in America as well. In America, it isn't that America wants to do all these things. It's just mm -hmm. that you have a president who's absent. Uh, uh, who's essentially a walking zombie and a vice president who is considered unserious. She's not read into most of the important things and things like that. Right. In that particular case, you have several silos within state department, mm -hmm. which keep meeting with each other on different kinds of things. I can tell you defense, the department of defense is almost monoblock solidly behind India state. Oh. There are some silos which are, you know, which get the nuance of what's happening in India and things like that. 
-hmm. There are several more who do not. And the third issue, of course, is the inadequacy of our own foreign service. You know, we don't engage with these people. We keep, say, criticizing USCIRF, the Committee on Religious Freedoms reports, mm -hmm. which are based on newspaper clippings. But when has the foreign ministry ever done, uh, you know, uh, uh, aggressive news conferences dismissing those news reports? Mm -hmm. They never call out news reports for being inadequate and things like that nor do they engage on a systematic basis with foreign diplomats in pointing out certain things to mm. them and uh, dispelling myths. So it's a very complex thing. Is there a toolkit? Absolutely. But I would say it's more a case of there is no deep state. It's a sort of convergent, corrupt interests of okay. individuals within the State Department who then make their personal priorities the priorities of their particular silo Mm -hmm. uh, who also need to, because, you know, it's a revolving door kind of thing in U.S. government. You come to U.S. government and then when the government changes, you go into an NGO or into a uh, think tank or into a, uh, uh, a university and things like that. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of adding their own retirement packages in that sense by listening to them on what to do and then by carrying out their agenda. Right, right. Absolutely. See, um, um what we have seen in the past also, Abhijit, uh, what you talk about is the bigger picture, definitely. Um, there have been incidents when uh, a few names like George Soros has come to the fore, uh, you know, in a way, uh, bulldozing the India's economy, you know, hitting it where it hurts the most, uh, the uh, sentiments uh, of the investors to the sentiments of the people of the country. How do you see for a country as big as India to hold its fort uh, not go haywire, and how do you think the current administration has handled the situation so far as far as the economic front is concerned? See, the economic front has been handled extremely well because, you know, uh -huh. we're not that vulnerable because we're not an export-dependent economy. Uh, on one hand, you know, you can't just, we're not that vulnerable to sanctions in the first place. The second thing has been because you have lots of regulatory powers, so on and so forth, you're able to control, you're able to prevent a lot of the kind of uh, runs on the stock exchange, runs on the stock market and things like that, which uh, some of these toolkit types try to do. Mm -hmm. And in this, I'd like to specifically point out not just Soros, but also Omidyar and those Hindenburg guys. Mm -hmm. Now, Hindenburg is, but for, a, for a company that keeps insisting on transparency, they're exactly zero transparent about themselves. Uh, we don't know what the ownership structure is. We don't know who's, in, uh, who's running it, uh, anything of that sort. Mm -hmm. Now, the issue is we've always been very uh, almost, I would say, defensive uh -huh. in how we deal. Uh, we react. We are not proactive. So, for example, what really prevents you from putting out an arrest warrant and primary, secondary and tertiary sanctions on Soros? See, Soros is can induce a run on the stock market. But if you put primary, secondary, tertiary sanctions on all, on anybody who has investment from Soros or associates with him, uh, what do you think is going to happen to Soros? Right. It really affects the portfolio very badly, right? Mm -hmm. You can do the same. Both Soros and Omidyar front some particularly hostile uh, propaganda press in India. Mm -hmm. That thankfully has been curtailed because if you remember last, either last year or last to last year, uh, there was this thing that newspapers cannot get foreign funding. It has to be approved by government, by mm -hmm. a select uh, committee of government secretaries, I think, uh, have to approve it and things like that. Some things have been done. There is a lot more that can be done, which is not being done. Mm -hmm. uh, understand, there are always restrictions. You know, you can't go the whole hog and then uh, fall into the trap of seeing, uh, uh, be seen to be the sort of dictator or whatever. But this isn't a question of dictatorship. This is a question of external influence mm -hmm. on your democratic processes, just like the so-called Russian interference in the 2016 elections. U.S. elections. Yeah. As we now know, never really happened. Mm -hmm. Whereas here you have a demonstra demonstrable chain of what is happening, right? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you you have uh, uh, you you have clear direct foreign investment mm -hmm. in uh, 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 newspapers, in news outlets, or whatever, uh, which should have never been allowed. There is a rule which says that a foreigner cannot be the editor of a newspaper. Why? Right. You should also make it that you can't be doing advertisement and uh, uh, investment and things like that as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, FDI and media. Very big question there, definitely, Abhijit. Um, now, talking about, uh, you know, geopolitically, if we look at India, obviously surrounded by quite a challenging adversaries there, China, Pakistan, Bangladesh, you have down south. 
you know, Sri Lanka, obviously with Chinese interest there, with, you know, a porous northeast, with uh, uh, Jammu and Kashmir, which has been uh, troubled by uh, the Pakistani intruders, Pakistani army and terrorists, uh, how do you think that India so far has performed in the last 10 years, I would say, uh, specifically during uh, Prime Minister Modi's tenure, how these strategies or policies have been effective in maintaining this stability generally in the country? Uh, very effective, in fact. You know, you might see some temporary reverses here or now, but when you change policy of 70 years uh, you know, you, you're bound to get some ups and some downs. But uh -huh. overall, it's been going in the right direction. Let's separate, say, Pakistan from China, right? Uh -huh. uh, with Pakistan, you had this standard. It, it was the sort of musical chairs in Pakistan where uh, one party would come to power. They'd make peace talks with India. The moment the peace right. talks were going well, yeah. there'll be some protests and then they'll be removed. Uh -huh. Then the army will come. The army will then, uh, uh, you know, uh, have peace talks with you. And then there'll be some internal coup within the army where you'll be removed, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and things like that. So, you know, this was, they never wanted to sort Kashmir out. Let's be clear about it, the Pakistanis. Because the moment you remove Kashmir from the uh, uh, friction table, mm -hmm. the, you know, the whole rest of the ethro, the reason for the Pakistan army's existence itself evaporates. Mm -hmm. So, you know, solving Kashmir is like telling the Pakistan army, please dissolve yourself, uh, which is not really going to work. And then, you know, you had these local politicians who would be echoing the same line that the Pakistanis wanted. People mm -hmm. like Omar Abdullah, Mahbubah Mufti say, talk to the Pakistanis. They are stakeholders. Why? Since when did, no. when did Pakistan mm -hmm. become a stakeholder in our territory? Right. So these people were essentially I, I, uh, parroting what the Pakistani line was while claiming mm -hmm. to be great patriots and things like that. We should also remember the PDP is the sort of, uh, if you take an Irish example, Sinn Féin was the political party which was not banned. Mm. IRA was the military wing which was banned. Oh. Here it's a triple wing. There's the Jamate e Islami, the PDP and the Hezbollah Mujahideen. The Hezbollah Mujahideen is the military wing of the Jamate e Islami and the PDP is the political wing of the Jamate e Islami which considers itself the intellectual wing of both of these things, right? So oh. this was a thing. Now, with the abrogation of 370 and, you know, the cracking down of the entire money laundering black economy uh, route out there, that mm. has been comprehensively ended. We need to remember the insurgency in Kashmir has ended. There will be terrorism. We need to remember even after the insurgency in Punjab ended, there was that bomb blast which killed the chief minister, Bayan Singh, well after the uh, insurgency had ended. Mm -hmm. You will see spectacular terror attacks happen. But that does not mean that there is a state of insurgency in Kashmir anymore, which means the leverage of Pakistan on you has been removed. They, they can no longer say, settle with us and then you will have peace. Not that land for peace has ever worked. I mean, look at what's happening in Israel. The whole mm -hmm. basis of that settlement was land for peace, the Oslo agreements. Uh, I mean, now, really, if, is, if, Gaza look, if Gaza looks like peace to you right now, well, what congratulations. Quite, quite a so, uh, Absolutely. Yeah. so so that has been handled very, very well. We have mm -hmm. the border defenses in place, which are very good. You know, no border defenses, like you saw on, uh, you know, the 7th of October in Israel, no border defense is completely foolproof. So there will be leakages that happen. But mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that the kind of, you know, uh, 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 before the border was literally like a sieve. Anybody who wanted to come through could come through. Uh, that has comprehensively ended. Now let's look at China. What, what mm -hmm. the whole point with China was, China would keep building infrastructure on their side of Tibet. Mm -hmm. And we build nothing in the belief that, you know, if we build infrastructure, the Chinese will overwhelm us. And the same roads we build from, say, Delhi to Leh will be used by the Chinese army as a highway to come in back uh, to okay. Delhi. Mm -hmm. That has stopped comprehensively. now. The infrastructure building is amazing. The border roads organization, which used to be one of the most corrupt organizations around, has been really fixed. Mm -hmm. Uh, the kind of construction you're seeing within every single year is more than what you've seen in the cumulative 40 years preceding that, right? Yeah. Uh, the kind of tunnels we're building out there, the access points we're building, the helipads we're building, uh, the military bases we're building out there. Why? Because, you know, this thing of let's not talk about our differences, let's not demarcate our lines, means that the Chinese could keep using salami tactics coming slice by slice by slice in mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and keep pretending it didn't happen, which is why Sham Saran, you remember, came up with a report because he's an avid hiker himself. Mm -hmm. And then he had to dismiss 
himself from the report and say, oh, no, 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 I didn't mean all of that, which showed that so much of land had been lost to the Chinese uh, uh, between uh, 62 and uh, um, uh, 2014. Right. All of that has essentially stopped. Is there going to be small salami slicing here and there? Yes, but the overwhelming majority, again, has been stopped. And, you know, these are the kind of red herrings that keep getting spread. Uh, either 5 meter chala gaya, it's the same as 5,000 square kilometers lost. Now, you see, 5 meters is not 5,000 square kilometers, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? So one was used to justify the other. Classic right. spraying of red. So mm -hmm. it's been managed very, very well. Has right. it have reached the end goal yet? No. But are we well on our way to the end goal? Yes. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, it uh, sounds reassuring. Thank you so much. One final question uh, coming uh, home, basically, the internal matters. How do you evaluate India's success in avoiding a descent into an anarchy? What lessons can other countries also learn from India's approach, if I may ask? Uh, the, the, look, it's a mixed bag. There's good and there's the bad. Right. right. The good is, you know, things like we discussed, the stopping of foreign investment into uh, uh, news outlets, especially shady yes. news outlets uh, of the type Soros and uh, Omidyar Love. Uh, on the other hand, I think, you know, the first thing you're taught about security is that you do not act when people assemble on the road. You act preemptively even when 10 people have assembled before assembling on the road when they're ready, getting ready to get into the tempo to come to the assembly ground. We have not been doing that. You know, we've had this sort of uh, very uh, laid back approach to preemptively tackling unauthorized demonstrations, riots, even when riots happen, for example, like on, uh, uh, you know, on Republic Day two, three years back, where the farmers stormed the uh, uh, Red Fort. Yes, yes. And down no, uh, yeah, we, we did not. You, In fact, you saw the shocking visuals of the police were covering and one side being beaten up by the rioters and things like yes, that. Yes, yes. We fundamentally need to change that. You see, uh, the, the counter to that is, oh, look at Sheikh Hasina. She shot down protesters and look what happened. You see, there, there is no one specific rule of dealing with these things. You, you prevent, had Sheikh Hasina not allowed the congregation to happen in the first place, you would have not even, even had to need to shoot them. Because you deal with it even before the protesters. See, after 10,000 people assemble, it's very tough to deal. The game is lost. But when you right. deal with them, when they're 5 or 10 getting on their tractors, setting off for something, it is much easier to deal with them without any violence. Right, right. What happens with violence is you can't control it, then it becomes a Tiananmen Square, which would be an unmitigated disaster. Correct? So there are there is a lot of lessons for us to learn. I think generally the government's soft touch policy has yielded results. Mm -hmm. Till it does not yield results, which is what we saw with Sheikh Hasina. You see, she had a soft touch policy. Mm -hmm. If you notice, for every single year in the last 15 years, the jamaat -e islami and the BNP have brought Dhaka to a standstill, sometimes several times every year. Mm -hmm. There hasn't been a single year where there haven't been mass protests like this. And it was always handled well till the time it wasn't handled well. Right. And see, you can't leave these things up to chance. That is why you need to be extremely proactive. Uh, so has it worked? Yes. Uh -huh. Can we, we can pray for it to continue working, but will something go wrong at some point? Almost certainly, yes. Yeah, yes, I mean, that's how, uh, you know, the Murphy's Law would also have it. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, Abhijit Ayer Mitra, their Senior Fellow, Institute of Peace and Conflict uh, Studies, IPCS. Uh, thank you so much, Abhijit, for taking time out. This must have been the first time on One India, but trust me, it is not going to be, to be the last time. We would love to host you more on shows like these. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye. Don't miss out. Follow One India for real-time updates. 